The section where we learn the chain rule is kind of the next piece in the puzzle that allows us to take the derivative of a lot more functions than we've ever been able to before. So between the power rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, and our trig derivatives, the chain rule is kind of the thing that kind of pulls it all together that allows me to basically take the derivative of any function now. Now there's some functions in Calc 2 that you'll be introduced to like the exponential and the logarithmic functions, the transcendental functions that you have not done anything with it in terms of derivatives that you'll learn about again in Calc 2, but really with those product quotient chain rules we can take the derivative of almost anything now. So the deal is this, before I, if I had to take the derivative of let's say x plus 1 squared, I'd have to square it out and I'd have to say well, that's x squared plus 2x plus 1 and then when I wanted to find the derivative, I'd say okay the derivative of x squared is 2x, the derivative of 2x is 2 and the derivative of 1 is 0 and so that would be done. And that's not, that's not bad, that's pretty easy to do, but what if I had something like y equal uh, 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 to the 50th for whatever reason. I don't want to expand this and multiply it by itself 50 times. Um, my powers would be horrendous, it would be a really long expression. It would be a nice polynomial expression which is easy to work with once it's in its correct form, but to come up with my derivative would be very, very difficult. So this is a good problem to use the chain rule with. So if you notice this with the chain rule, this is actually called a composite function. A composite function means it's made up of two different functions. So I have one function here, f of x, that's equal to the argument or the base, and then I have some other function that we're working with here that's talking about two particular powers. So I could have some g of x that's equal to, let's say, u to the 50th. So if I looked at the composite of these functions, then I would actually be able to come up with this original function back. So how would that composite for, uh, function work? Well, the way that we could work with this is in terms of f of g of x or g of f of x. Now only one of these will work correctly, so we need to figure out which one it is. Now f of g of x, another way I can rewrite this is f of g of x. Another way I can write g of f of x is g of f of x. Now what this means is everywhere in my function f, I plug in the function g. So everywhere in f, I plug in the entire function g, which would be u to the 50th. So f of u to the 50th then would equal 3 times u to the 50th squared plus 2 times u to the 50th minus 1. That's not what we want. That's not equal to this value. So we didn't want f of g of x here. So it depends on how you write your functions and you should always check. Now g of f of x means everywhere in my function g I want to plug in the function f of x. So this would be 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. Well that's easy enough. This is the only value here that's a variable. So I plug in 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 to the 50th. So this is the one I want. Whoops, I don't need that piece up there. But this is the one I want. I want the g of f of x. And it just depends on how you define your functions. It could have been f of g of x if I would have defined these a little bit differently. But basically I can look at this and I can say, okay, let's combine these and let's go ahead and take the derivative of these values. So to get started, the derivative of 3x squared plus 2x minus 1, that's easy enough to work with that's just 6x plus 2. The derivative of u to the 50th, that's easy enough to work with as well. That's 50u to the 49th. Hmm, okay. So you might think about that and say, well, I must plug in this f prime up here, but that's not quite the case. If I wanted the derivative with respect to x of g of f of x, and again I can use the composite notation like I have here, g of f of x. What ends up happening here is, is I plug in one function into the other and I'm actually taking the derivatives. So the way that this would end up looking like is the derivative with respect to u of my g function times the derivative with respect to x of my f function. So let's go ahead and take these derivatives. We already have them up above. This would be 50 u to the 49th times, little dot is 49, 
6x plus 2. Okay, but this doesn't look quite right either because we have u's and x's mixed together which we can't have. I need these all in terms of one variable. So now I substitute in what I know u is. Well, u was my function up here. What was to the 50th power? 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 was. 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 was raised to the 50th power and now I have 6x plus 2. So this is the derivative of my function and it was found using the chain rule. Now that explanation kind of shows how I can take derivatives with composite functions but it's not really all that clear. So let's go ahead and look at look, uh, finding the chain rule a little bit different way. So our function was y equal 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 to the 50th power. Now the way I think about the chain rule is I think about it as the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So chain rule, derivative outside times derivative inside. Now it's called the chain because it links back and I can actually take a lot of these times each other and I have to keep remembering derivative, derivative, derivative. So when we start taking our derivative I take the derivative of the outside. I bring the 50 down, decrease the exponent by 1, and when I decrease the ex that exponent by 1 I get 49. So this is the derivative of the outside. So I'm going to call it outside prime. Now this is a prime mark, it's not outside to the first, it's outside prime. Now I want it times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the inside would be the derivative of 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. And again, I'm just writing out my work here to make it clear and easy to follow. So here's the derivative of the outside. And then I have it times the derivative of the inside. And I should write up here, this is inside prime. Now when we actually take the derivative of the inside, I get 6x plus 2. Now this follows through exactly with this little bit more complicated approach, but basically I have the derivative of the outside, which is our outside prime, times the derivative of the inside, which is inside prime. And that's my solution. So chain rule, the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And that's how we're going to think about these, and we're going to do these a lot. And so getting used to that way of saying it is usually pretty helpful. And again, you always want to keep track. The derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Let's go ahead and look at another example. Um, let's look at this in terms of derivatives, multiple derivatives, position, velocity, and acceleration. So we have an object moves along the x-axis so that its position function at any time t greater than or equal to zero, I can't have negative time here, is given by the function cosine, or sorry, x of t equals the cosine of t squared plus one. Okay, now these are kind of weird notations because we're used to the x being inside here, uh, of the argument of the trig function being x, but now you can see the argument of our trig function has changed. So what I would like to do is I would like to find the velocity and the acceleration of this function. So let's go ahead and start with velocity. Now remember, velocity I'm going to call v of t, and that's just the first derivative of our position function. In our case, our position function is given by x of t, so this will be x prime of t. So x prime of t. Okay, chain rule says the derivative of the outside. Okay. So the derivative of the cosine is a negative sine t squared plus 1. This is outside prime. I don't mess with the argument of a trig function. It never, never changes unless I apply some identities to it. So this is the derivative of the outside, and now I need the derivative of the inside, which would be the derivative of t squared plus 1. And I have a bad notation here. Let's clean that up not the derivative with respect to x, it's the derivative with respect to t, because my variable is t here. So x prime of t, which of course is the velocity, is equal to negative sine 
t squared plus 1. And again, that's the derivative of the outside prime. It's outside prime. And then the derivative with respect to t of t squared plus 1 is 2t plus 0. The derivative of 1 is 0. Now, what we need to be careful about here is this 2t plus 0. I don't multiply that by t squared plus 1. Anytime I have coefficients, constants, I need to pull them out front. So this is negative 2t sine t squared plus 1. That is our velocity function. It's also the slope of the tangent line at any point along the curve. Now let's go ahead and look at acceleration next. This will be very exciting. Now acceleration is a of t which is the first derivative of velocity or the second derivative of position, which in our case position was given by that x of t, so we could write it like this as well. But basically I need to figure out the derivative of velocity. So acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Okay, well that is going to need the product rule to find that next derivative. So I'm going to have to apply the product rule here. So this is, aren't these fun when they get to combining the rules, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule, and trig derivatives? What could be better? So I have my first function times the derivative with respect to t of my second function plus my second function times the derivative of my first function. And again, parentheses around the trig functions are essential. And also laying out the derivative before you even start I think is very helpful. So our acceleration is going to be given by negative 2t. I'm dragging that along. The derivative of the sine of a function is going to be the cosine of the argument times the derivative with respect to t of the argument. This is my chain rule. This is outside prime. And this next part is my inside prime. The derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. Okay, and then working from here, I have plus sine t squared plus 1. I'm not taking a derivative here. And the derivative of a negative 2t is just a negative 2. So simplifying and taking derivatives, the negative 2t I drag along. Cosine of t squared plus 1 was outside prime. Inside prime is going to be 2t, but remember I'm going to want to pull that out front here because I don't want to confuse the argument times 2t. That's not what's happening. They're multiplied by the cosine, not the argument. And then here I can pull the negative 2 out front right now, sine of t squared plus 1. So rewriting acceleration, it says 2 times 2 is 4t squared, a negative 4t squared cosine t squared plus 1 minus 2 sine t squared plus 1. That's my acceleration. Now of course if we were to go further from here and take the third derivative for my jerk function, what would happen is I'd have a product rule here including a chain rule and then also a chain rule over here but no product rule. So these get pretty involved very very quickly but they're still very workable. So this actually brings up a whole other set of rules when we're talking about derivatives of trig functions. So remember in the last section you memorized some trig derivatives, but those were only useful when my arguments were x or theta or just a single variable. What we need to do now is we need to look at trig derivatives in terms of the chain rule. So first of all, let u equal a function of x. So another way we could say this is let u equal f of x. Now when we take our trig derivatives, and again these need to be memorized, the derivative with respect to x of sine of u, meaning this u could be any function of x, is equal to the cosine of u times u prime. Now another way you'll see this written sometimes is du over dx. So sometimes you'll see this written as cosine of u times du dx. So sometimes you'll see it written like that. I prefer the u prime notation just because it's a little bit shorter to write. So the derivative with respect to x of the tangent of u is secant squared of u, u prime. Now that's not u to the first, it's u prime. The derivative with respect to x of secant of u, and remember u is some function of x, is equal to, now watch this one, secant of u, 
tangent of u, u prime. Notice I have to have my argument with both the trig functions and then I only have the derivative at the end. I don't have u prime after each one of these. I only have the general deri derivative of the original argument. So be careful with that. It's a common mistake that students make. So I also have the derivative of the cosine, the derivative of the cotangent, and the derivative of the cosecant of u. Now remember, when I take derivative with respect to a trig function that begins with the letter c, it's negative, negative, negative. So the derivative of the cosine of u would be negative sine of u. u prime, the derivative of the cotangent of u is negative cosecant squared of u, u prime, and the derivative of the cosine of u is negative cosecant, or sorry, derivative of cosecant u is negative cosecant u, cotangent u, u prime. So arguments have to be here. Sometimes students write this as cosecant, cotangent, u prime or something like that. Can't do that because then I can't evaluate those trig functions. So that's no good. So these simply need to be memorized. So let's go ahead and practice a few more of them. Uh, for my next uh, derivative, let's go ahead and look at using the chain rule more than once. So let's look at y equals tangent, let's say, of 4 minus the sine of 3x. Okay, so let's keep track of our derivatives and our chain rules here, because this is going to have more than one chain to it. So the derivative would be the derivative of tangent of u. Basically, I'd be letting u equal 4 minus sine of 3x. The derivative of the tangent of u is going to be secant squared of u. And this is the derivative of the outside. Now we need it times the derivative of the inside. So I need the derivative with respect to x of 4 minus the sine of 3x. And this is the inside prime. But we're going to get into trouble here pretty soon because I'm going to find out I have another outside inside. So here's my outside prime. Now the derivative of 4 is 0. I'm going to write it in here even though we don't need it. And then I need the derivative of the negative sine of 3x. But this is another outside inside bit. So the derivative of the negative sine of 3x would be a negative cosine of 3x and now I have the derivative of another this is turned from the outside to the inside now I need the derivative with respect to x of the argument of my function 3x so I chain it back so this is the derivative of the outside all of this is the derivative of the inside but within this derivative of the outside I have another outside inside and it starts to get a little complicated but the thing to remember is you have to keep taking derivatives until you have all the arguments accounted for so let's go ahead and write out what the derivative is going to look like I have secant squared 4 minus sine of 3x and over here I have negative cosine 3x and remember, none of these mess with the argument of the trig function, and the derivative of 3x is 3. So I can't mess with this argument at all. Now everything here, I need to pull out front because they're coefficients. I don't want to mess with this argument. So I get y prime equals negative 3 cosine of 3x secant squared of 4 minus sine of 3x. And that's my derivative. Okay, always pull these coefficients out front because if you don't pull the coefficients out front, sometimes you make the mistake of getting them involved with the arguments of your trig functions and you just don't want to do that. Let's go ahead and look at some examples where we can rewrite to find derivatives. So for instance, I might have the function uh, y equal, uh, let's do something pretty easy, let's do something like 1 over 2x plus 1. Well right now, I have to use the quotient rule because before I learned the chain rule, that's all I had. So y prime would equal the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared.
Now the interesting thing is that when we start to take this derivative, the derivative of a constant is zero. So this entire first term goes to zero. So I kind of just wasted a lot of time there. Minus one times the derivative of two x plus one is just two. Then I'm left with two x plus one quantity squared. So you can see a lot of effort was wasted here because the derivative of the numerator goes to zero. So it looks like what I'm left with here then is negative two over two x plus one quantity squared. So that's my derivative. And again, you can check these in Maple. Let's do the same problem again, but let's go ahead and take and rewrite this and use a chain rule. So I'm going to rewrite and I'd end up with y equal 2x plus 1 to the negative 1. And now on this one I'm going to use a chain rule instead of the quotient rule. It's a lot faster, a lot less work. So I ended up with y prime is equal to the derivative of the outside. So I bring the negative 1 down and I decrease the exponent by 1. Minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2. This is the outside prime. Now I need the derivative of the inside now, so I need the derivative of 2x plus 1. So let's go ahead and write that out. y prime equals, and again this is inside prime. So I have a negative 1 times 2x plus 1 to the negative 2. Now the derivative of 2x plus 1 is just 2. Now rewriting this, this piece right here flips into the denominator. So what I'm left with here is y prime is equal to a negative 1 times 2, they stay in the numerator, over 2x plus 1 quantity squared. And that's my derivative. So you can come up here and compare up here the negative 2 over 2x plus 1 quantity squared down here as well. Up here I use the quotient rule, down here I use the chain rule, and as it turns out, you can choose either one. You'll get the correct solution. Sometimes one of them is a little bit more work than the other, uh, but a lot of times rewriting to a chain rule um, is a little bit shorter. Let's go ahead and look at another problem. Let's look at, uh, these are fun, y equal cosine to the sixth of negative 2x squared. Okay, so first of all, this doesn't really look like a chain rule right now because I don't really see an outside inside. But let's go ahead and rewrite this. And I recommend that you rewrite this every time you see it because what ends up happening here, even when we get into some other techniques called integration eventually, rewriting this helps us determine the correct value of what's going on here. With the six up here, it's not as clear. When we write it like this, I say, oh yeah, the derivative of the outside, derivative of the inside, that's easy enough to do. So let's go ahead and take the y prime. The derivative of the outside, I bring the 6 down, decrease the exponent by 1. So 6 minus 1 is 5. Now I take the derivative of the inside. So I take the derivative of the cosine of negative 2x squared. So I'm just dragging this along. Now the derivative of the cosine of 2x squared is going to be a negative, because the derivative of the cosine is a negative sine of u, or the argument, times the derivative of the argument. So I end up with y prime equals 6 cosine negative 2x squared to the fifth. Again, I need to group all of these together eventually too, but right now I'm just wanting to find that derivative and the derivative of a negative 2x squared is a negative 4x. So there's everything. There's my derivative. Now let's rewrite it to kind of group things together in a way that makes sense. So it looks like I have a negative times a negative is a positive. 6 times 4 is 24, so I have a t positive 24x. Okay, now I have a cosine to the fifth negative 2x squared sine negative 2x squared. That's my solution. Now order doesn't matter when you multiply, so it doesn't matter if you write the sine first and the cosine next. We usually just write things in descending powers, so we usually write the highest powers first and kind of work down from there. Again, slope of the tangent line at any point along the graph, that's what we're actually looking at there. Now we took a rational expression and we rewrote it as a chain rule, but we can also take something that's a quotient rule and rewrite it as a chain rule as well. 
So let's go ahead and take a function, let's say like x squared plus 2x plus 1 all over 3x to the fourth minus 5. Now I'd have to use the quotient rule on this and if you want to go ahead and go through and verify the quotient rule but I could also consider rewriting this in terms of a product rule. I could flip that denominator up top and give it a power of negative 1 and now I can use the product rule. And again, you can still use the quotient rule on it and they'll simplify to give you the same solution, but sometimes the product rule is easier, so it's totally up to you. So product rule says the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay, let's go ahead and find that derivative. So I have x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, and then I bring the negative 1 down, decrease the exponent by 1, and now I need to multiply it by the derivative within. So that's our chain. Plus second times the derivative of the first. Now the derivative here is nice, it's just 2x plus 2. So rewriting, and again, I haven't finished the derivative yet because I haven't finished the chain rule. So I have negative quantity, 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative 2. Now the derivative of 3x to the fourth minus 5 is going to be 3 times 4 is 12x cubed. The derivative of 5 is 0 plus 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative 1, 2x plus 2. So there's my derivative. Um, it really needs to be simplified uh, quite a bit. Let's go ahead and do that a little bit. There's some cool tricks I want to show you here anyway. And these are fun. Okay, so now we pull the 12x cubed out front and the negative. So I have a negative 12x cubed. And then I have this 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative 2 times that trinomial x squared plus 2x plus 1. So this first value right here simplifies down here. And then over here, I notice that uh, I have a 2x plus 2, which would be 2 times the quantity x plus 1, times 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative 1. So still, I'm working on simplifying this. So a couple things I see. Here I have both even numbers, so I could factor out a 2. And then I have this 3x to the fourth minus 5, and I also have a 3x to the fourth minus 5 here that's a common factor. So I should be able to factor out a 3x minus 4 to minus 5 to the negative 2. And I want you to get used to this factorization. It's, kind of, it's not a very common skill to have, and it sometimes comes in handy. So if we factor out a 2 here, I'm left with a negative 6x cubed here. So that one's good. Now, the 3x minus 4, 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative 2 has been factored out completely. Okay, whoops, it's been factored out completely. And then I'm also left with this trinomial, x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, now again, I've completely factored out the 2. I'm left with x plus 1. And I factored out 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the negative 2. But here I need a negative 1 power left. And so if you think about the reverse, if you multiply like bases, you add exponents. What would I have to add to negative 2 to get to negative 1? And the answer is 3x to the fourth minus 5 to the implied 1. And again, run through that a couple times if it's not clear because this is a really interesting way to factor and solve without having to find common denominators. So if we distribute here, I get minus 6x to the fifth minus 12x to the fourth minus 6x cubed. Then I'll distribute through the x plus 3x to the fifth minus 5x. Distribute through the 1, 3x to the fourth minus 5. Hopefully I can combine some like terms here. So 2, 3x minus 3x to the fourth minus 5 quantities to the negative 2. Uh, negative 6x to the fifth plus 3x to the fifth would be minus 3x to the fifth. Let's see if I can kind of keep track of these a little bit. 
Uh, looks like my minus 12x to the fourth plus 3x to the fourth would be a minus 9x to the fourth uh, minus 6x cubed minus 5x minus 5. So there's my descending powers. Now I don't see anything common here that I can pull out. I don't see a coefficient. I don't see an x. So finally rewriting without negative exponents and decreasing powers And then this value right here I flip. So this would be 3x to the fourth minus 5 quantity squared. So there's my derivative. So again, the derivative gives you the slope of the tangent line at any point along the curve. This is no different. And you might look at this and say, wait a minute, the derivative was clear back here. I mean, holy cow, the derivative was right here. That was actually where the derivative occurred. All the rest of this was algebra and simplification and they're algebra skills that you should have in place so you can manipulate these equations because eventually what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and we're going to want to say where does this equal zero? Well it's easy to see where something equals zero when it's in factored form. Not this one so much because we have a fifth power. And Then also looking at the denominator and notice with the denominator there's no reason to expand it. So we've looked at some pretty good questions here. Some of them are uh, pretty complicated, but I do want to give you a couple heads up on a few others. Dang, these are fun. Okay, let's go ahead and look at um, the derivative with respect to x of 3x minus 5 over 5x plus 2. And let's go ahead and make this to the fourth power. Now this one we have two choices and I'm not going to work this one out for you but I'm going to give you a couple of options here. Option one. I could take the derivative with respect to x and use the chain rule. And the way the chain rule would work here then is I'd bring the 4 down, decrease the exponent by 1, and then I would multiply it by the derivative within. And the derivative within then would be a quotient rule. Or we know now we can pop that up and rewrite it as a product rule as well. But I'm going to put quotient here. But again, you could rewrite it as a product. Another option would be to take the fourth root, or the sorry, the fourth power and distribute it to the numerator and denominator. Now I can't distribute it through the binomials but I can distribute it as such. And Then from here I could use the quotient rule and of course this quotient rule will involve a chain rule. Another option would be to take this from my previous step and flip it up top and rewrite this as a product rule. And of course this product rule will have a chain rule with it as well. So there's quite a few different options here and again with this quotient rule I could also rewrite this as a product with a chain. So I have a lot of options here for rewriting but it doesn't matter what option you choose you'll get the same exact solution as long as you simplify completely and correctly. So again, in Maple, if you do your product quotient chain rules in a little bit different order, or different fashion, it shouldn't matter. You should be able to simplify it to get to the same value. And remember, if you take your answer minus Maple's answer and you get zero, that means they're equivalent solutions for derivatives.